Welcome to the Eye on Annapolis Local Business Spotlight. There are thousands of locally owned businesses in the area, some small and some large. Some you may know and others you don't. But one thing they all have in common is a great story, and we want to share it with you. Join us every Saturday as we talk to the founders, the owners, and the managers of local businesses you have come to know and love, and those you will come to know and love. Now here's your host, John Frenet, with this week's Local Business Spotlight. Well, I'll tell you, you know what? We hear about transitions all of our lives, and generally there's never a guidebook that tells us uh, how to get through it all, um, You know, whether it's being single, getting married, or you know, being married and getting divorced, employed to self-employed, or maybe even back prison to freedom. And one that I really never really considered was transitioning from military life to civilian life. And that's where John Wojcik comes in. How are you today? I'm doing pretty well. How about yourself? Good, man. Thank you very much for uh, opening up your home. It's a beautiful home and uh, talking about a exciting new book that you just wrote, uh, as well as your company, Mission Next Consulting, which sounds very militaristic, which probably is a great name for a uh, you know, a, a consultancy on figuring out how to transition. You know, well, well, tell me about Mission Next. What what is, what is it all about? Well, Mission Next came to be because uh, we discovered a problem. My uh, Kimberly England and I discovered a problem a couple years ago. We spent two years researching the problem, which is 65% of active duty military personnel leave their civilian job within 24 months. It's a staggering statistic. Uh, if you talk to an HR leader in a company, they will typically tell you that their turnover rate for the first year, second year is around 19%. But for service members, it's, it's, it's 65. So we spent two years researching the issue. Uh, Syracuse University did, did a study in 2015 that discovered this 65% number. And we did a two year research study to find out how that applied to active duty veterans, in particular to military officers. And what we found was uh, what we found was was uh, pretty striking. Well, that that blows my mind. I was just on the phone with my daughter up in New York, and we were talking about turnover rates in the PR and communications world. Uh, nationwide, it's like twenty seven point two or something like that. Sixty five percent within two years. I mean, what what is causing this? I mean, is the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Space Force, I guess now, and you know, the Coast Guard and Merchant Marine are they not preparing? There are people, or is it just that different of a lifestyle? The, the the Department of Defense has 85 different programs out there to help veterans transition. And when you think about it, if you need 85 programs, that's probably too many programs that aren't working. The General Accountability Office did a study to see how those 85 programs were working to help veter veterans transition, and they learned that most of them were marginal at best. During our research study, we found that Cultural friction is the main reason that veterans are leaving. And what does cultural friction mean? Well, it means that you have a service member that is used to wearing their rank on their, on their, uh, on Sleep. their uniform, right? <laughs> they have a military skill that they've spent basic training and their advanced training. And then they do four or five years and then they go to an advanced school for, you know, a couple of months and they build on those skills and they grow those skills. And every aspect of their life is military. They, salute when they're outside, they stand up when a senior officer comes in the room. And that even happens in, in the uh, civilian aspects of their active duty life. If they're at the mall off post or off base, and they see a senior officer, they'll say, good afternoon, sir, good morning, sir. Rank translates there. So then you take that same veteran and you pull them out of their active duty lives. They don't, they can't walk around with their rank in their back pocket. It doesn't work that way anymore. So they have to understand how they have to fit into this civilian work environment, learn the cultural norms, learn the culture and see what they can do to fit in. In particular, what we learn is that most veterans, when they leave active duty, they end up taking their first job that's available because they need a paycheck. You know, they, they, they get their terminal leave. They have four or five or, or six weeks. In that time period, they hunt a job, they shoot the job, they take the job. And generally speaking, they take the same type of job they had when they were on active duty. So you, you extrapolate that a little bit. So if you're 18 years old and you join service, maybe you want to be in the combat arms or maybe you want to go into in intelligence, you're not the same person at 25 that you were at 18, right? But it's the job that they know and they feel comfortable when they leave to go take that same job. So they end up in jobs that they really don't want working with people they don't understand. And 
in the middle of all of this is this cultural friction where they just can't, they just really don't feel like they fit in. He's the army guy or he's the Navy guy exactly. in, in, in a business, just a little bit oddball out. Well, what brings your qualifications to this other than studying it for two years and, and figuring it out? I mean, you, I'm assuming you have a military background yourself as well. I do. I do. I, I enlisted in the, uh, in the infantry when I was 18 years old, I spent uh, a couple of years in the national guard. I went to law school and, uh, after law school, I got commissioned as a, uh, judge advocate in, in the national guard as well. After September 11th, I, uh, quit private practice as an attorney. I did uh, medical malpractice defense uh, litigation. So I quit private practice and I went on active duty as the general counsel for the Michigan National Guard. Did that in 2002. I did that for 20 years and I just retired. Well, thank you for your service and congratulations on the, on the retirement. Thank you. It's, it's been a great ride. And so I myself, I'm in the middle of this transition. I retired on March the 31st and um, I could have left my active duty job and looked for a general counsel or an assistant general counsel position because that's what I did for 20 years. And if you read our book, Mission Next, you'll find out that that would be the wrong decision for me, right? Because I'm not the same person now that I was when I went on active duty as, as a, as a uh, general counsel. Sure, absolutely. Well, you know, it, you know, as I've I've talked to another woman that owns a financial consulting business. She's not a financial planner, but it's a consulting business, and she said also that she's working with a lot of the folks out on Fort Meade. You know, military's got their own. I don't. I don't say issues, but I mean there's certain uniqueness about it. You've got housing usually provided for. You've got your meals. You've got stipends. You've got you know. You've got the whole nine yards. It's very regimented, certainly. And she's finding that when they get out into real life where they get off base housing or they're on their own that just managing the money it's like you know and, and that's what she advised she says okay well let's tackle these let's figure out how to pay it so i mean you know that transition i mean i i see that all the time it's uh you know it's it's difficult you know i imagine the book is probably a, a big help there um you know and and you know i'm somewhat surprised i mean some of these numbers you said that you know you've got they've got 85 programs this reminds me when uh do you remember a product that google put out called google wave I don't know. By chance. It was one thing. It was one of their long list of failures, but they put it out. And it was like the night. It was like, it was social media. It was all the office programs and everything all, all wrapped up in one. And there was a 45 minute YouTube video that they put out to explain it. And I'm like, if you need 45 minutes on a video to tell me how to work this you know, life changing program, uh, it's not working. And, and with 85 programs available to, military transitioning that's crazy and 65 percent the numbers are staggering because you know we're here in annapolis where we've got the naval academy and we've always heard that you know a service academy you go to a service academy and you're, you're set for life and and their lifetime earning potentials and everything else that's all there and, and the jobs i get that but you've also heard that military enlisted is also a very good springboard to you know pretty much any type of career that you may want i mean because there's you know, the military is a microcosm of the larger world. I mean, you know, if you want to do aircraft mechanics, you can do that. If you want to do cyber, you can do that. If you want to do, you know, law enforcement or, you know, certainly, you know, you wouldn't necessarily think that there'd be, uh, you know, you know, JAG lawyers and, you know, in, needed in the military, but they do, you know, so, and that, that really surprises me that there's not, that there is that much of a problem switching there. Do you find, have you found that there are any specific areas or careers that, really gel with somebody coming out of the military or is it really dependent on what they did in the military? Well, it's a multifaceted question with a multifaceted answer. So we see situations where we have senior leaders, in particular military officers, an army captain on active duty will be in charge of around 250 to 300 people. They leave active duty, they get, they get their first civilian job, and they find out that the human resource leaders for those businesses, they really, really, really want to be veteran friendly. They say they're, they're veteran friendly. They advertise they're veteran friendly. But yet when they interview this army captain who's been in charge of hundreds of people and, and tens of thousands of dollars worth of equipment, will look at them and think, oh, you would work great on our product assembly line because they don't know the difference between an enlisted and an officer. Well, what you were just talking about, the different military specialties that are out there, not everybody knows that. And in particular, there's a lot of human resource leaders in small and mid-sized businesses that will take a an army major or a uh, Navy commander, and they will treat them as a lower enlisted because that's all they really know. That's what they've seen on television. They, they expect it just to just be a bang, bang, you know, here, here, here's your rifle. 
<laughs> you, know, you know, go go squirm on your belly. But exactly. What what makes a business veteran friendly? One of the things that we learned through our research and through our consulting business is that uh, the states do things pretty well. In particular, in Maryland, you have the Maryland Veterans Affairs Agency. Their whole job is to help transitioning veterans come off of active duty, find their first civilian job, help with resumes, help with relocation, help with community events to make sure that this veteran finds a place, a community where they where they culturally fit and find a job that is a good fit for them. Every state has one. They have them in Michigan. They have them in Ohio. They have them in Virginia. And a lot of businesses just don't even know they're out there. So if a business would pick up the phone and call the Veterans Affairs Agency for their state, there'd be somebody on the other end of the phone that would really be able to help them become a veteran friendly organization. With any program within any any government, you just don't it, until you really peel back that onion several layers, you really don't know what what is out there, what is available. And yeah, you know, there's got to be a better way to get that information out to the general public. Okay, my father was in World War II. He was down in the South Pacific in the Marines. And, you know, and and the my age was I was not subject to a draft, but I did register and all all of that. But and I and I didn't serve in the military. But you know, if I have a an affinity for you know what the greatest generation has done, and I own a business and I want to do that, I mean, you know, damn, I want I, I want to be the best that I can be to the folks that I'm hiring. I would value certainly, you know, some advice from you or, or the state to be able to sit there and say, well, look, this is what you need to do. What, what, what's the best advice you can give somebody coming out of the military and, you know, forget everything you learned in, in the last X years. So, so the, the, the military spends on average around $200,000 to bring somebody in off the street get them in, in the, into military fatigues, send them through basic training and their advanced training, almost a quarter of a million dollars in most cases. And then more, more money and more training throughout their whole career. They don't spend the same amount of money to help them transition. This is where the 85 programs come in. In a perfect scenario, a veteran would be 24 months out knowing that they're going to leave to start their transition plan. They need to do a self-assessment of who they are currently as a service member, doing a great, fantastic job in the Army, in the Navy, in the Air Force, and project out, who do I want to be in 24 months? What, time of, what kind of person do I want to be in 24 months? Because let me tell you, that 24 months goes very quickly, and the next thing you know, the service member is ready to transition and has not prepared. So in our book, Mission Next, we have tools and tricks to help veterans get ready for that transition, to get in front of it, and project out in the future, where do I want to be? Why do I think I want to be there? There's values exercises that they need to go through. You know, do I want to grow my family? Do I want to have, you know, more children? Do I want to live in a city? Do I want to live in a country? How often do I want to be at home? Do I want to travel a lot? Do I not want to travel a lot? What we found through our consulting business and in the research for the book is that veterans are burned out by the time they get off of active duty. They, they spend a lot of time overseas, in particular the Army where they'll do two or three or four tours or deployments in a six-year period. They're exhausted because they have to go to training all the time and they're away from home. They don't want to come and they should not want to come and get a job where they have to travel a lot. But if they end up in the same type of job they had when they're on active duty, they're going to have to travel, right? right. So so we we want to help the veterans take some time, take a, take a step back and look at themselves and say, what's important to me? Is spending time at home more important than the paycheck? I know my son, when he graduated high school, he, he was the one that was going to be the biggest screw up of the three of my kids because he had no idea what he wanted to do when he came out of high school. And at one point he was considering going into the service and he took, I don't remember the name of the test, but there basically it was some sort of an aptitude test that came out and said, hey, in the military, this, 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 this all sort of meet your interests, your desires at this point. These are the areas that you would want to look into. They don't have anything like that on the way out? Uh, they don't. Um, and and the, the reason that they don't is every service member is different. And, uh, and what we do is we encourage the service members to, uh, and, and again, it's, it's in our book, Mission Next, but the book will walk you through all of the things that you need to do to figure out what type of job is going to be a good fit for you. And once you have that figured out, because you started far enough out, you can now start start thinking about 
are there additional certifications that I can get? You know, do I need to go to FEMA to get these FEMA certifications? Because maybe I want to go to work for Homeland Security or to work with uh, as a law enforcement officer. Uh, or maybe I want to go uh, and, and transition into an IT field so I can get IT certifications. I can get my C plus or whatever other certifications are out there to enable me to go to Booz Allen Hamilton and, and work in IT. Right. Let's talk about your book. I mean, you obviously you determine that there's a need and uh, we do need the manuals. <laughs> you know, there's nothing wrong with looking at that. Why, why did you decide to write a book as opposed to just working as a consultancy with Mission Next? The research project that we did uh, ended up this past November where I I earned my doctorate in uh, business administration. And well, I should have called you Dr. John Wojcik. John Wojcik's fine. <laughs> okay. And uh, as part of that that doctoral thesis, we, we did this research project and we learned so much through the through the research, right? With 24 months working on this project, we learned so much. I didn't want it stuck in a dissertation Right. That's that's uh, that's saved on the on the Internet somewhere. I wanted it to get in the hands of service members so that they could take a look at the book and do a little bit better in transitioning. Right. If they learn something, they learn that one tool, they learn that one trick. Maybe they take a job that they're going to like and they're going to want to stay there for more than 24 months. What's been the reaction so far? Uh, it's been fantastic. We um, did a book launch party here in Annapolis at Mission X Barbecue uh, a couple of weeks ago. Look at that. You have Skanda with their name. It's just Mission Barbecue, but you threw that next in there just to keep with your brand. I like the way you think. That's right. <laughs> and uh, so we did the book opening, uh, had a bunch of people look at the book, read the book, take a look at it. We've gotten uh, some some pretty good reports back about the value of taking a step back and looking intrinsically to who am I? Where do I want to be? What, what, what kind of person do I want to be in 24 months, five years? And what steps do I need to take to get there? As a part of that transition, these veterans are going through a change and change takes time. You can't just blindly find your way into this new environment. You have to take steps. You have to take active steps to know where you want to be, know what that change is going to look like for you, and then take those action steps to actually get there. What happens to the 65% that burn out of the, that job, the person? I mean, you, you also hear a lot of stories about, you know, veterans uh, that are homeless and you've got the VA that's not, not stepping up where they should and everything else. What happens to that 65%? I mean, I've got to think that just knowing the black and white life of a, of a, of a serviceman, that that's got to feel like a failure. You know, hey, I went into this job and, you know, I mean, it's a mission. It's, you know, we've got to accomplish the mission. You know, if it's not complete 100 percent, it's it's failed. Is that a problem? Yes, it is a problem because you have the 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 service member mentality of this tough bravado. They, they, they've had to wear that bravado for, you know, four years, six years, however long they've been in service. They get into their first civilian job and they just don't fit in. So when they tell their HR leaders when they're leaving on their exit interviews, what do they say? They say, I'm leaving because I got a better job someplace else. The pay is better. The benefits are better. But what's really going on inside? That veteran's coming home from work every day saying, I don't fit in. I don't understand these people. One of the uh, the participants that, that we interviewed during the research study was quite candid with us and said, I can't even send an email to civilians in my organization. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, look, he said, after the weekend, I send an email saying, Sally, I need an update on this project. And Sally runs the HR and says, I'm picking on her because I didn't ask Sally how her weekend was. And he, and he looks at me and says, why do I have to ask them what their weekend was like? And I said, look, this is all part of this culture change that you need to go through, right? It's, it's, there's more to just going to work and managing a project. You're going to be dealing with people and it, the people think and feel a different way than they did when you're on active duty. Oh my word. That's hysterical. I, I, I had a conversation with my kid the other week and it was, uh, we were talking about like, when you respond to an email or an inquiry, is it acceptable to say, yeah, that'd be fine. I'll be there at three. Or do you have to go in? Oh, hey, how you doing? Okay, good. And she's like, well, it, it, and we, we got into this whole discussion as to when it was appropriate, whether they were senior to you or junior to you. And, you know, it was, it was interesting. And I, that's just something so small and minuscule that I never would have considered. And culturally, it's, uh, you know, so we talk about language in the book. And so there's, you know, there's a military language, Roger, got it, sir, ma'am, all those things, you know, we talk about military time, you know, right now it's 1536. Right. But if I send somebody an email and said, hey, be at my place at 1536, they're going to email me back and say, I don't understand what time that is. You're, you're going to make me do the math, right? Right. But service members do subtle things like this all the time, and they don't realize it. But what they're doing is that they're marginalizing other people in the work group. 
the the other civilians in the work group are thinking, I don't understand military time. Does he think that he's smarter than me? Are they making fun of me? Right? All of those things are going on in this in the in the coworkers' minds, and the military and the veteran has no idea what's going on. So, so little subtle nuances like that. Uh, showing up for meetings on time. Uh, as a veteran, you go to a meeting in, in, in the when you're on active duty. The meeting starts right on time, and if they don't. You know, there's somebody's getting in trouble at the end of the meeting. You know, I, I, I love it here in Navy. It says, you know, when they get the flyovers, it's a three, it's a three thirty kickoff game. It kicks off at three thirty four. The jets will fly over at you know three twenty seven. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But in the civilian world, meetings never start on time, right? And depending on the, on your work culture, you know, you can have accounting. You know, it's okay to be fifteen minutes late for a meeting, but maybe in operations in your in your organization, the meetings start five minutes late. But these veterans are sitting there in their chair and they're losing their mind because you know they got there five minutes early and nobody's nobody's even there for the meeting. Wow, I, it's it's got to be tough. It has to be tough. Where do we get the book? I'm assuming we can get it on Amazon. Yeah, you can get the book anywhere. It's on Amazon. It's on Barnes and Noble. Uh, it's on the Target Book website. If you do a simple search for Mission Next, it'll pull it up, and you can purchase the book. That's a very, uh, very simple name. Very actually, it's a very apt name. It's a very good name. I think it is there. Um, working with you, I mean, you. The name of your company is Mission Next Consulting, and I mean that presumably means that you do consulting. Yes, we do. So my partner in the business, uh, Kimberly England, has done human resource consulting and business consulting for 25 years. She was a shareholder in a business consulting company in Toledo for close to 15. And so what she brings to the business is the HR leadership, the strategic communications. She's also a board certified coach. So she coaches CEOs how to be better CEOs. Or if you're an aspiring CEO, she can coach you through the different processes talk about your emotional intelligence and different things that you can do to be a better leader. Um, and what I bring to the business is the military aspect. I speak the military language that she doesn't speak, which is important. Um, and we put those two together in the consulting business. So that's a, per- that's a perfect combination to, to do it. It's a great fit. And so we have two different branches for the business. So one of the things that we do is work with service members to help them transition. We do uh, coaching with the veteran where the veteran can reach out to us. Our website is missionnext.biz. It's pretty easy to remember, missionnext.biz. And uh, we can uh, sign them up to do coaching. And we can do coaching six months out or a year out or two years out. And what we do is we work them through values exercises so that they can project where they want to be. And then we hold them accountable as they get closer to those dates. Did you did you get that training certification you were supposed to go to? Did you look at the cost of living in, you know, in Annapolis, Wherever. Maryland? Did you do all these things to prepare? And uh, the, the other, on the other side, we work with uh, HR leaders in small to mid, mid-sized businesses to help them find veterans, to help them understand the language that veterans speak. Because when the veterans send you their resume, it's going to be a military lingo, right? So you have to <laughs> get all these things that I don't even think about. You've got to is... decipher it, you know. So, so what does it mean when you have a uh, a platoon leader that's done three combat tours in Afghanistan? Well. To me, as a veteran, I would think this person had to train their personnel. There's around 30 or 45. They had to go through a bunch of certifications with them, make sure they work cohesively as a team, that they can operate at night, that they can order the food and all of the other logistics stuff they need for that platoon to get it on a boat or a ship to get it overseas, do all of their missions, maybe engage with senior political officials over there, and then come back. But... As an HR leader, you're looking at platoon leader and three tours in Afghanistan, and you think of a person that shot people for a living, right? Or people with guns. And that's scary. And HR leaders don't want scary, right? They want leaders. So what we want to do is to show the HR leadership, look, when you bring a veteran on your team, these are all of the leadership skills that you get. Because trust me, from a from an E5 sergeant up through a 04 major in the Army, the leadership training that our veterans get is absolutely phenomenal. And it's a lot more than than uh, than these small and mid-sized businesses even do for their own leadership. True. But then and also coming along with that leadership, though, you do have the tactical training, the weapons training and everything else, which is that I guess sort of needs as you transition out and as you retire, you have to sort of peel that away unless you're going into that that type of an industry. And, and I think that's probably the the hardened part. And I, I could be talking out my butt here, but I mean, the hardened part of a, you know, of a, of a military member, you know, is, is the weapons and training and the, the, the physical training and everything else that goes into it, as opposed to 
the mental and the moral training, which would be the leadership skills that most businesses would want. Exactly. And small and mid-sized businesses can do something that's pretty cost effective to, we talked about before about how, how do you become veteran friendly? Start a veterans affinity group. A veterans affinity group is, is nothing more than a group of veterans within your organization. They get together once a month or every other month and they can be informal. They can be formal. Uh, maybe they show up and all the HR leadership has to do is give them a box of pizza, right? Food brings people in. And, and so the veterans can get together and talk about, sure, they're going to talk about their war stories and where they've been and what they've done. They're also going to talk about how do I fit in in this civilian organization, right? What did you do that worked and what should I not do? You know, you've been did here you get for five into years. HR because you didn't ask Sally how her weekend was. Too, Is, exactly. You know? Exactly. Yeah. So what, one of the people we interviewed for the dissertation, um, I was an HR leader for a, a, a hospital in Ohio and um, had to bring a, a recently hired veteran into her office and say, you can't swear like you do. We're getting complaints in HR because every other word you're using is the F word, right? And we understand that you want to motivate your team, but you can't do that here, right? And he looked at her and said, I didn't realize I was doing that. That's just part of my speech, right? So it's, 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 and that needs to change. It needs to change. You know, you got you, you have to assimilate to the new culture. So so we also work with HR leadership to help them. They have to do an assessment, right? Because we talked before about uh, how do you help veterans in your population. <laughs> for for the HR leaders out there, I would I would question you to say, look, what documents or data do you have in your in your files or your records to tell you who within your organization is a veteran? Because generally speaking, once you onboard somebody, HR loses all that information. Right. They don't know who, who, who their veterans are in their, in their, in their organization. So, so we have to find out, you know, who within our organization is a veteran. And it sounds easy because you think, Oh, if you served on active duty, you're a veteran, but we have people in the National Guard and Reserves, uh, that have maybe never done a, a, a deployment overseas. They don't see themselves as a veteran, right? To them, veteran means combat veteran. So they're not going to raise their hand. What HR leaders need to say is, have you ever served in the U.S. military? Right. That's the question. That's the golden question at, they have any, to ask. at any level, at any level. Right. At any level, because even if you you signed up, you joined the army, you went to basic training and you got injured and, and kicked out. You served. You served. You're a veteran. Right. So we want to bring you on our team. We want to embrace your leadership skills and use them. And then obviously that that type of person probably has a different skill set because they haven't been ingrained in the military for that. Language. It's funny. You talked about the language. My father, great World War II story. He's at home on leave and. Mom and his mom, my grandparents are all happy to see him and everything else like that. And he looks over and he says, oh, yeah. Hey, mom, pass me the effing butter. <laughs> and no sooner did it come out of his uh, out of his mouth was the hand across the table. And yeah. it was just like, and he's like, okay, we're, we're, we know where we are now. Yeah. This is great. Missionnext.biz is where you want to go to get some more information from Dr. Wojcik. You know, if you know of a... You know, of a military person that's looking to get out, that's planning on getting out anytime soon, give them the resource. Uh, look at the book, get it at Amazon or Barnes and Noble, or, you know, you can purchase it right off of missionnext.biz, uh, I imagine too, right? Yes, yes. There's a link link to our book on the website as well. What else do we need to know? Anything else? Or we got it all. <laughs> it's a never-ending, uh, never-ending topic. Yeah, for we, sure. we we could we could go in for quite a while. Um, so, but the, the most important thing is so for the for the business leaders out there, um, I, I I would just I I would encourage you to look back at your systems and say, you know, if we've been saying that we're veteran friendly, how do we know that? Right. How do we know that? How do we know how many veterans we have in our in our within our organization and of the veterans that we have? How do we know that they're that they're happy? One thing that, that came up during our research is that the HR leaders were all telling us we're veteran friendly. Right. But when I asked them questions, can you explain the difference between an officer and an enlisted person or what does a lieutenant colonel do in the army? They, they really don't have any idea, right? So, so there needs to be some education there where if they want help in learning this military language, Mission Next Consulting can help them. It'll help with the onboarding process. It'll help with retention because we can help them create a veterans affinity group. And, uh, and we can break down those cultural frictions between their, their, uh, the service members they have in, in their organizations, uh, with their, uh, with their coworkers. Yeah. I mean, I think there is cultural friction, even in the civilian world, just changing jobs. Of course. I mean, you're, you're the new guy. You're the oddball. You're what, you know, whatever it may be. But that 65% turnover needs to, you know, needs to come down there because, uh, 
And when they're turning over, they're either being asked to leave or they're leaving on their own because they're not happy. It's demoralizing uh, to a degree. It, it really is. I mean, and I imagine it's even more amplified in a service member's mind. You know, we had a mission and we didn't complete it. You know, that's something that they're going to have to work with to get understand as you get more back into civilian life. Great resource. John Wojcik, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for your time. It's, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening to this week's Local Business Spotlight. Please make sure to visit ionanapolis.net for all your local news, events, and opinion. And in case you haven't already, please subscribe to the Ion Annapolis Daily News Brief, where we bring you all the day's local news direct to your phone, tablet, or computer in about 10 minutes. It comes to you at 6 a.m. every Monday through Friday, and you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.